everybody. Welcome everybody to um, April's edition of um, the Anthony P. Consciousness Hour. Many few years ago now, um, I was contacted by a gentleman that lives comparatively close to me by the name of Jürgen Zeva. And Jürgen's initial concerns were, were quite interesting ones in that um, he was worried that his, the cover of his book, his first book, Multidimensional Man, which is this one here, looked very, very like the cover of my first book. And I have to admit that there is a similarity there. But uh, looking into this, you'll find that the symbolism of mirrors and people looking through mirrors and reflections is extremely common. Uh, the reason being that this seems to be very much a theme that people use when they're discussing such things as out-of-the-body experiences, near-death experiences, or anything <coughs> where you're moving from one state of um, awareness to another state of awareness. Jürgen then very kindly sent me a copy of Multidimensional Man, and I found it absolutely wonderful. The reason I found it wonderful was because Jürgen writes in a very, very nice style of writing. It is very intimate, and he describes his own experiences in, in great detail. Now, Jürgen is very much, as he says himself, he's an explorer of alternate states. He's not somebody necessarily seeking out the answers or the, the reasons why we experience these, because he doesn't need to know this particularly, because he experiences them on a regular basis. Now, Jürgen and I have met up on two or three occasions now, and we always have fascinating conversations. And indeed, prior to this show, a couple of days ago, we had a, a chat on Skype. And it always goes extremely well, because he, he is just so knowledgeable in terms of altered states of consciousness and alternate places we can go. Um, and also what is fascinating about Jürgen is, is that he is an incredibly good digital artist. So he unusually is able to, to bring back the images he sees in altered states of consciousness and then depict them for us so we can see them. Now, what I'd like to do is um, firstly to just introduce Jürgen. So Jürgen, very much great to have you on the show. Hi, hi, Tony. Nice to speak to you again. And you. Right. So what we'll do is, um, what, I, what I always find with Jürgen is we can just spin off into ideas and everything else really easily. So that's why I'm particularly looking forward to this show. But what I'd like to do a little bit, so the, the, the listeners and the viewers and everybody else in the background there can know a little bit about you, Jürgen. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you, you, you came into this ability to, to, to move into altered states of consciousness? Yes, I, I think that's a really long story, uh, so I try to keep it as short as possible. Um, I, quite early on in my life, in the 70s, I became interested in meditation, and, and it was nothing more than some friend of mine, I, when I told him I was going through a depression, he suggested I should try meditation, and and I did. I went to Transcendental Meditation seminars, and, and then I got really interested in the whole subject of it. And so I started reading books about it and so on. And, and then I was fascinated by all these um, enlightened masters and, and beings, and uh, I was interested in the Indian philosophy and tradition. So... I started regular meditating and then I got deeper and deeper into it. And in the end, I thought I, I want to be one of these guys who uh, know all the answers. <laughs> I was quite naive, really. So I started meditating uh, as if there was no tomorrow. I was meditating about five hours every morning. And I did that for six months. And after six months, I noticed that I became more stressed, more aggressive, and it had the absolute opposite of what I actually set out to achieve. And so I thought that was a really bad idea. So I thought, okay, that didn't work. I just go back to my normal hedonist student life and, and, and leave it at that. But then something really incredible happened. Out of the blue, I was... Uh, you know, having coffee, and one morning, I suddenly had this dissociation. I couldn't somehow link my awareness or my uh, my hands to myself. I, I couldn't figure out how, who they belonged to. 
So, uh, and this went further. I suddenly realized that my body um, was a, an alien thing. I couldn't relate to it. And before I knew, I suddenly lost all identification with my physical body and myself. I had no idea what was going on. And just quickly, this, just quickly, what, just quickly, what was the circumstances you were in when this happened? Were you with friends? Were you on your own? Or no, I, I was having breakfast. I made myself a really strong cup of coffee and a really sort of doorstep sandwich, and I was just tugging into it. And suddenly, I I looked at it and I thought, "Who does this belong to? Why, why am I holding this?" There was a total dissociation to what I was actually doing, and this escalated to such an extent that I lost the whole <clears throat> complete sense of identity. And before, before I knew, I was gripped by an incredible ecstasy. And, <clears throat> and, and the whole room changed. It became all light. And before I knew it, I was standing in this incredible uh, light, you know. And then, and then I had this incredible feeling of clarity and and truths, and it's almost impossible to, to describe, but it was a feeling of intense um, clarity, you know. And this lasted for about half an hour, and I gradually sort of came back into my body, but my, my world had totally changed after that. I was walking around uh, in this dissociated state for about a couple of weeks in, a, in an incredible state of peace and contentment. There was no, I felt there was no outside world. Wherever I looked, I just, that was just me because my identity had shifted from this personal thing to, to everything I, I saw in, in my environment. And I, uh, I accepted that. It was an incredibly nice feeling, and, and then it faded away. But after that, shortly after that, I had, it started off as lucid dreams. I became aware in my dreams. And then one day, out of the blue, I, I was um, married then. Um, we lived in a small town in, in Germany, and out of the blue, suddenly I found myself standing in front of my parents' house my mother's house, and I was in full awareness, and the curious thing was I had a 360-degree vision, and I was fully awake, and I couldn't figure out what was happening, and it was only when I looked down on the ground that I suddenly saw something resembling my body appearing before my eyes, and I had no idea what, what had taken place, and I looked around, I looked at all the details in my environment, the tree and the garden, I saw every blade of grass absolutely crystal clear. I was fully awake. There was no doubt about it that I was in my, in my hometown, you know, in, in front of my mother's house. And this confusion so raged through me, and my first thought was, how do I get back? You know, how do I get back? I, I knew very well that I, I shouldn't have been here. You know, I should have been in my uh, in my bed, you know, 80 miles away. You know, and I thought, what do I do? What do, I do? do I take a bus or, you know, I had no concept at all of what was taking place. And with this thought, I suddenly zoomed back into my body. And, and then this, the trouble started because the first thing I woke up my wife, I said, you know, I've just been to to first, you know, you know, my hometown, and, and Julia was a bit sleepy, said, go back to sleep, you know, you had to dream, you know, no, no, and so I started, but she wouldn't buy it, and, and then I took off to the library the next day, and I tried to look at and all sorts of subjects. One was, uh, the first I started off were medical conditions. I thought I may have had a brain seizure or something very, very strange has happened, you know. And so I spent most of the day until I gradually eased my way from the medical section through the psychology section, which was right next to it. And next to the psychology section was parapsychology. And there I found a book which was called Doppelgangers. 
And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. So I, I started reading it, and that was the first clue I had that there may have been something supernatural. But you have to bear in mind, up until that time, I, I was, I didn't believe in any of that. To me, if people talked about a ghost or anything like that, I just thought they were not slightly you know, slightly silly, really, and uh, superstitious, and all this sort of thing. It didn't mean anything to me. Even, even when I was meditating, I, I, I dismissed anything like that, anything or call as simply nonsense, you know. And this sort of um, it got my attention going, and and then also after that, because there was very little, it was 1973, Okay, 1973, 1974, there was very little written about it, especially not in the German language, you know, and there was very little I could actually find out about it. But then a friend of mine who I mentioned to, he mentioned Castaneda, Carlos Castaneda. And and then I read a book by Castaneda, which was called uh, this, A Separate Reality. And that was the first time I found out that yes, there is a, such a thing as an out of body experience, and and then I became really interested in in this subject. But it was not until we moved to England that I really started pursuing it, and and then I started having regular out of body experience, which came quite easy at the time, and that went on and on and on for for many years after that. So that's <laughs> okay. Just, there's, there's, one, there's two or three points there that I'm really, really interested in. Um, the, the, the 360 vision um, is something I've come across a great deal, particularly with individuals who take um, mind-altering drugs such as dimethyltryptamine and other things as well. And it's one of the things they say is it seems that you have this complete awareness of everything that's going on around you and everything is, is, is really vivid in the way that you see it. Um, I was also intrigued that you found yourself somewhere else that was part of this reality, but not in a way, you know, finding yourself in front of your mother's house. Mm. And I'm fascinated by your reaction, which um, I've heard many times before of this is so real. Now, when you went in a dream scenario, we don't ever think this. We don't ever are yeah. self-aware enough to think, how am I going to get back to where I mm. am located? Because in dreams we just we just readily accept the fact that we're in these scenarios. So clearly this is something that's hyper lucidity. You were you were aware that you were Jurgen in yes. this place that mm. was not the place you should be and how you got back. But I, I'm I'm very interested in, in in the point you make about the doppelganger idea and the mm. idea of, of doppelgangers because we know from parapsychology and from normal psychology that there is a thing called hoitosc hoitoscopy and autos autoscopy, whereby mm. you can see your own image in front of you in some mm. way. Now, again, this is related to disassociation, mm. which, again, is very much one of the points you were making, weren't you, that you had a build-up to it, whereby yes. you felt that there was this sudden strangeness about your body and being in your body and the disassociation of your hands and realizing there's mm. something more curious going on. Mm. So clearly this initially was, was something that happened spontaneously. Yes. You were then suggesting that as time went on, you started to develop an ability to do this slightly more control. Can you explain the process by which that then took place? Because I'm sure an awful lot of the listeners and the, the people watching us out there would love to be able to know how that comes about, how you can suddenly start to make and control it slightly more. So please carry on with the narrative of, of how you went on. And talk as long as you like, Jürgen, because I think okay. it's, it's how you explain this. It's not, my, it's not me we want to listen to, it's to you. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think the first experience is sort of mystic experience, for want of a better word. You know, where I had this dissociation for my body and suddenly entered this pure state of consciousness, I think that was actually the thing that disrupted my cohesiveness, you know, my identification with my physical body. That, I think that sort of triggered it all off and there was no way, it, it was almost as if it destroyed the 
the connection, you know, the normal um, conditioning, okay? And after that, my mind was almost set free, and I think as a direct response to that, these out-of-body experiences started happening, coming very easy. And after I took a really great interest in it, I found it. I only needed to uh, to want it, you know, that I had uh, the ability to project out of my body, but I still couldn't actually find out a method where I say A leads to B and B leads to C. It, it always seemed to happen spontaneously, and sometimes when I least expected it, either in the morning, you know, after I went back to sleep, or uh, in the middle of the night, you know. But uh, at other times, I tried to really um, sit down for an hour or so and build myself out of the body, and that usually was unsuccessful. It was only when I didn't have any intent, you know, it happened then spontaneously, all, almost by itself. And I started recording all these things, because uh, to me that was absolutely new. I, I then, in the meantime, we lived in England, I found a lot more literature, uh, Robert Muldoon, uh, I think Sylvian Muldoon, one of these people, a long time ago, uh, um, and uh, I think Edward Fox is another one of the early people who who uh, had written about it. And then, much later, I found a book by uh, Robert Monroe, and Robert Monroe was the most detailed description, and a lot of the things he wrote about, I found, they were also applicable to me, you know. And so I, I had these experiences and what I did is I kept a record of it, a very detailed record, and just put them in my diary and then left them there. And, and they remained there for about 30 years. Um, I didn't really talk to people about it because whenever I started talking about it, I, I got funny looks. And uh, at that t in those days, you wouldn't talk about it. There was no Internet. That was just an aberration. So... You know, even my best friends didn't really know about it because I shut up soon. And then um, only about in 2008, my daughter found all these diaries I had written, and she said, what is this? I said, well, these are all my out-of-body experience. I've kept a diary. And and she suggested I should write it, uh, type it out, because uh, she could read it, because she couldn't read my handwriting. So I started, <laughs> I started typing them all out. And and as I read through those, you have to bear in mind, once I had written those, I never really looked at them again. And so for the first time in 30 years, I started reading them, and I said, oh, blimey, that's really interesting stuff here, you know. And um, and. I started typing it all, and suddenly I saw there was a, a narrative which was going right through it, and uh, lots of things happened in the in the time. For example, there was a period which lasted for about six months where I met, uh, when I was out of my body, a Chinese uh, master, you know, a very very spiritual, powerful personage. And he actually trained me. He started off by giving me riddles, and he poked fun at me, and uh, and you know, and put me through all sorts of kinds of tests and things, um, which I then recorded in in the book Multidimensional Man. The, finally, after about six months, um, he and the training was very interesting because. In the end, we, start, we started using uh, not words or thoughts, which is the usual thing you, you give, uh, you communicate simply by knowing on, on those sort of types of levels. You don't have to actually verbalize things. It's almost like a thought transference. But then he started using images and, and symbols. And I soon discovered that these symbols were like a language belonging to a higher state of consciousness, you know. And it was, and whenever he communicated these symbols um, to me, um, attached to them was always like a vision of something, a scenery, a knowing of something which 
uh, I, I knew about, but I had no recent connection to, you know. And then came uh, an episode in out of body experience where I was introduced into these much, much higher states of consciousness. And, and that was in the intensity. It was very much in the same league as the first one, which set all this off, you know. So after that, um, I kept recording, I kept making um, excursions into that. I saw myself very much like a reporter, you know. Uh, what I experienced, I wrote down. I found better ways of retaining the information. Um, I found better ways of recall, uh, you know, and also all the time I was doing that, I kept up my meditation practice, so I could, um, my focus became very good, um, and my awareness, my attention, so I could prolong these uh, out-of-body experiences simply by keeping my attention focused on the place where I was. And I also was able to bring more details me and sort of impress them on my physical brain because the thing is it very very much works like uh, when you wake up in the morning and you had a dream okay you may just the first few seconds you may still remember it and then a few seconds later you just have fragments and then after about five minutes it's all gone you know, you know you had a dream, but but you just haven't got the connection anymore. And I made sure that because I wasn't dreaming, because I was fully aware, before I went back into my body, I would simply um, impress my physical brain with what just happened, you know. So before I even got into my body or before I opened my eyes, I, I went through the whole scenario again, but I had uh, the full visual content with me rather than remembering. I, I was uh, living through it again in a way because it was still much more vivid this way. And then as soon as I went back into my body, I woke up, I just kept my eyes shut and I, I just uh, ran through it again. And that, that created the, the recall in the physical brain. Now that became so, so potent and so powerful that even um, weeks later, I could make the connection and actually remember further details. Um, the best, the best um, comparison you can make, let's say you've got a house in France or something and you visit it um, once a year, you know, and you get to know the place and when you come back, uh, you know, you find it quite easy to recall where you you know, where the kitchen kettle was and, and other details, you know. So, so basically you create a space, a mental space of your property, let's say a house in France, but you can then go back and tap into the memory and, and get further details, okay? Maybe you just uh, have made a conscious effort. And this, my, my recall worked very much on the same basis. So when I went to a certain place like now, um, and I look back at, at a scene where I visited a family which I've written about in my uh, second book, Business of Infinity, I can still see the sitting room right in front of me as if it was, yeah, that one, as if it was my own sitting room. I can still go back in there and I can see there's a table there's a sofa. I, I remember the three women. One was at the other side of the room. So these, memori these memories are just as vivid as any physical memory you have. You know, for example, if I, if I think back of the place where I lived before, I can still visualize the place, you know. So th this reality is, is exactly like a physical reality because you experience it in full waking consciousness. You know, I think that's uh, that is really important. And um, over the years, I, I simply had to accept that the reality we live in here at the moment is only one of many realities, and we can actually access other realities uh, simply by shifting our awareness, shifting our attention. 
One of the, um, the major reasons that we consider this reality to be the reality is because it's consensual and because the things we experience in this reality, you go to bed at night and the bedroom is in a particular shape and a particular configuration. And when you, when you wake up in the morning, the bedroom is in the same configuration. And also that you can share experiences with other individuals within this universe and you will agree with what you've seen. Now, what you're saying here is that you can reproduce that in the out-of-body experience in the sense that you can actually go back to a location that has the same integrity that it had before. I mean, I was particularly interested, you know, with the going back to the ladies and that they're in the same position as if you've absented yourself from that part of reality and gone into another timeless place, which is this one, to be able to then go back into the reality again, back into the alternate reality at the point you left it. Now, this reminds me very much... Sorry, yes, go on. Yeah, no, that's only a recall. I, I was just trying to express um, the, the the recall. It's just as vivid as I, okay. if I were to recall a, a physical memory. I mean, I, I, I don't even know whether these three ladies would still be there, you know. Uh, but, I mean, the recall is just as vivid as the recall from um, from a physical experience. You know? So I, I didn't, I, I can't make a qualitative difference between the out-of-body experience experience in a separate reality uh, between that and, and our physical reality. To me, these, these realities are, are just as valid, you know, but they are, um, they are multiple levels of reality and I realities, and I try to uh, explore these in my, both of my books, which are linked to states of consciousness, you know, and so... Um, there are literally infinite types of realities, whereas we have a physical reality here, which you mentioned is a consensus reality where we all agree on and we can have shared experiences. Um, but there are equally equal numbers of consensus realities which are non-physical, which people can also share, and they usually share them by being on the same wavelengths, if you like. You know, so if you have people, for example, who are interested in in certain things like like dancing and arts and things, they will meet other people who are on the same wavelengths, and they will have created a, an environment which uh, uh, aligns itself with their tastes and with their likes and preferences. You know. And and these these realities are literally infinite. You can have anything from from very dark and sinister realities which people share because of their negative mindsets to very sublime and beautiful, uh, elevated realities which people also share, you know, because of their mindsets. And 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 that's really interesting because. Um, yeah, I mean, we just happen to be in an environment here which happens to have a certain configuration of, maybe, let's say, atoms working, uh, atoms or energy is configured in a certain way which, which makes it physical. But beyond that, there are lots of other uh, energy configurations which may be on a different um, level or on a different vibratory rate, which makes them just as real when you are on that level, you know. And that's what I found. So I couldn't say, uh, I could no longer say, okay, what we experience here, that is the only reality. Everything else is just in the mind. It's just made up. It doesn't work anymore because it doesn't convince, it, it wouldn't convince me that it's so because it's like convincing somebody uh, who is sitting next to me and say, hey, hang on a minute, there's not reality here, you are just thinking it is, you know. It's impossible to to not accept this anymore when, when you have this total experience. Well, I think that's... We'll come, back. I was yeah. say, we'll come back to the levels of reality. The one thing, because I'd like to, to really focus in on that um, later on in the discussion, the one thing that I, I really would like to focus in on, you mentioned about the, the Chinese master mm-hmm. that, that worked with you. 
Um, did you ever find out anything about his motivations, who he was, what his background was, or anything about him? Because he seems to be investing a great deal of time in helping you. So I'd like to know a little bit about, did you ever learn anything about yes. him as a person? Yes, I did. When I first met him, the first feeling was that I knew this guy, you know, and I knew him quite well. It was almost as if he was an old friend, but we lost contact. You know, and whereas he was in a state of consciousness which was quite elevated and quite powerful, he had, a, he had an incredible charisma. He was a very laid back chap. He had a great sense of humor. He, he was not like some dream figure. He was a total sovereign, independent individual, this, this, this personality and character. My feeling was that I, um, that I knew this chap, but I had forgotten. You know, and he, he, uh, I mean, almost as if he were friends, equals, in a way. But his authority, his energy was much more potent, much more powerful, and he then demonstrated it by taking me into these higher, introducing me into these higher levels of consciousness, you know. And, um, and the thing was, he, um, he, he wasn't responding in a way you would normally uh, people, I mean, for example, when I first met him, he wasn't standing or sitting, he was just lying casually on his side. And then I talked to him, and I was overawed by, by his presence. And, and then I thought, oh, he is a great spiritual master, you know. So I, instinctively, I sort of bowed down uh, to show my sort of reference, and he kicked me away with his foot, saying, can you imagine how silly you look at somebody walked past and saw you like this, you know. And and he was uh, he was always sort of poking fun uh, and and always slightly sending me up. But uh, we we created this bond, you know, and which enabled um, us or which enabled me to uh, to pick up a lot more knowledge and information. And he would would give me tests, you know. He said things like, um, there was a door I had to go through, and intermittently there were spears uh, coming into the door. And if I got it wrong, it would sort of kill me or something like that. And all these sort of little tests he would invent for me. And I had to find the right mental attitude to, to solve these tests. And they went on for months. And, um, yeah, until he felt, I think, it was right uh, for me to take take it a step further. Before I actually met him, I had so many out of body experiences that I became almost a little bit blase about it. It was, uh, and I felt I didn't really progress much. It was like being here, but in a non-physical reality, and nothing really much interesting happened. I wanted to go further. I, I knew that there were much higher levels, much more interesting levels, and it was out of this. Um, frustration that I I called out for some help that he he made an appearance, you know, and and yeah, and that was all sort of happening in the 70s until the 80s, early 80s, and then of course I had a very long break um, because I had a family, but I still meditated, I still had out of body experiences, but I didn't record them anymore. I didn't. Uh, enter them in a book, I sort of lost interest. I was building up a career as an artist, you know, and illustrator at the time. And it came back again sort of in the 2000s after the kids had left home and and I had more time to devote to my spiritual um, thing that I then got back into this mindset. Okay, so the billion-dollar question, which is the question I always ask under these circumstances, and we have discussed it many times privately over coffee and everything else, what is the difference between what you consider to be an out-of-body experience to lucid dreaming, or are they elements of the same phenomenon? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, I always felt lucid dreaming... Um, I had I had, a, I had lucid dreams before I had my first out of body experience. I found them very curious, you know, and I thought, oh, they were beautiful, very vivid, incredibly realistic dreams. And the fascinating thing was, I was aware that I was dreaming, you know. But then 
I didn't pay any more attention to them other than there being a special sort of dream, you know. Now, um, I still have uh, lucid dreams and out-of-body experience, but I started learning uh, that you can actually use the lucid dreams um, and turn them into an out-of-body experience. And, and the way I did that, my definition of a lucid dream is basically a, simply a dream in which you are aware. And the content the lucid dream takes is usually taken from the subconscious. You know, it's your own personal field, and it has its, its own narrative, you know. So, so very often in a lucid dream, dream there is some a narrative attached to it. You know, there's, it appears to me there's some sort of story, you know, something happening, a group of people, they talk to you, and, and something happens. And I find... Uh, this, the content of these lucid dreams is primarily taken from um, this, the own individual personal subconscious, you know, and it's then fleshed out, and I, I don't think anybody else uh, is participating in it. It's just your own private world. And therefore, because of this, you become incredibly powerful in it. You can do almost anything. Your creative abilities are unlimited, you know. Whereas when you're in an out-of-body state, you are limited. You haven't got infinite power. You are limited by the state of mind you're in and the energy uh, you carry with you. You know, for example, I noticed in an out-of-body out of state, I sometimes find it very hard to fly, you know, almost as if I was weighed down, whereas in a lucid dream, the world is your oyster, you can do anything, you know, whereas in an out-of-body state, you are, uh, your energy is determined by your, your mindset. For example, I found if I really wanted to fly, I had to have much more positive thoughts, you know, and then that had a direct impact on on my uh, levitation, you know. Sometimes I, I found it even hard to move a few feet, you know, and I noticed that when I elevated my my energy that I suddenly could shoot off. Also then you find, you attract people. For example, uh, I remember one time when I, when I shouted, give me some help, you know, and suddenly somebody came from behind me and gave me a mighty push and flung me up into the air and and this, and I heard people giggling, you know. So so there were people which who I attracted, they had a little bit of fun seeing me sort of flapping away, trying to get some lift and and stuff like that that happens. And and when I say the difference between the two is the lack of narrative, there is no narrative. Um, you go from A to B very much in the way you would go from A to B here in physical life. Let's say you go to the, to the shops, you know, there's no narrative, there's no story, you just do the things you do. And in an out-of-body experience, you do the same thing. You are in an, in an alternative reality, and there's no story. You're just doing things, you meet people, you talk to them, and and I find my my main occupation during these out of body states, I learn to, to talk to people and interview them and find out what it is all about. And I discovered very soon, because of the enhanced level of communication, when I started to talk to people, not only was I privy to what they were saying, but I suddenly had insight and participated in everything they experienced. So if somebody said, oh, I used to be a lorry driver, then I was sitting next to him on his lorry as he was driving around in it, and I knew the make of the model, the color, you know, where he was driving and so on. So I, I, I had the whole picture. And that's why I found it very uh, a great information source rather than looking around and see, oh, well, what's there? There's a tree there and there's such and such. I found I had much more access uh, to, uh, you know, to the reality of these realms by talking to people because they would take me on to their own journeys and they provided like sort of um, insights into this reality. 
And, and so that became a great source of my uh, information I gained from this by interviewing people. And in Business of Infinity, I, I wrote stories about, uh, there was one, one story uh, where I met a waiter in a hotel uh, on the next level. You have to bear in mind that everything that exists here also exists there. You know. By the way, Jürgen, Jürgen, I absolutely love the waiter story. He was called Kay, wasn't yeah. he, as I remember? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell this one. It, it is fantastic. It's really... And the way you describe it in the book is incredible. But please continue. Yes, that was an interesting story because I went to this uh, place which which was like a super-duper holiday resort. And it was strong with people, a bit like when you go to Venice in high season. The, the, the streets are crowded and everything. Everybody was having a really great time. And it was a really beautiful, incredibly interesting, diverse and rich place. So I, I went on this tour through the crowds, watched all the sideshows and everything. I took a great interest. My my awareness was totally established there. I had full, there was no danger that I would wake up because the focus was totally anchored in this reality. And that is another thing, really, because uh, sometimes I felt uh, I was so heavily rooted in this alternate reality that on occasion I even wondered whether I had actually died, you know, and, and wondered whether... You know, how, how am I going to get back, you know? And later I, I just didn't worry about it anymore because it, it inevitably happened. But um, this was one of these occasions where I really took my time and, and wandered around in this. And I noticed the places, the, the hotel where I started off was full of people, waiters. And I thought, why on earth would anybody become a waiter and serve other people when they had all the freedom in the world to do what everybody else does, you know. And then when I talked to one to the lady, she said, well, you know, there are people here who need to learn the, um, the principle of service, you know. Mostly the people here who are, who are serving people, who are waiters, they haven't they have no knowledge of what it's like to to help other people, to be their fathers, and they're just selfish, selfish people, you know. And and she then suggested I should stop, talk to Kay, who was leaning on the wall there, you know, with a white uh, waiter's jacket. And and I went over to him and I talked to him. And the moment I saw him. I could see right through him, and I saw um, that he was quite a hideous, I saw like a hideous uh, being behind him. And he became instantly aware, you know, and he said, I'm sorry, you know, normally I can hide my, my past, but uh, you obviously can see through me. And then he started uh, telling me that he was a really evil bastard in his past, you know. And he started then telling me his life. And as he was telling me, he literally transported me into his world. And I, I, I walked along with him. And it's not, you have to bear in mind, it's not that you have a linear story that you follow like in a movie here. You know, which has a beginning and you go through the movie and two hours later the film is over and you wake up. It's not like that. You, you have a knowingness. It's almost as if you have the whole uh, scene sort of happening all at once, you know, and you can, it, it's knowing instead of following a, a linear thinking process. And that's the thing which I also talked about when you get into much higher states of consciousness, your thinking simply changes. You, you're no longer a linear thinker. You know, you are a lateral thinker. You, you, your thinking is, is, it happens on simultaneously on many different levels. So you end up with knowledge, a knowledge building, which you then need to translate into linear language in order to communicate it on this level. But when you're on a higher um, dimensional level or higher state of consciousness, this linearity, this linear narrative um, 
doesn't apply anymore. You know, you, you just know. And I talked about Kay. I knew his helper he, who came to, re- to his rescue. And although there seemed to be a considerable time um, which he needed to get out of these very lower dimensional levels into the higher dimensional levels, I could see the whole story in, that in, one, in one big chunk and one picture, and it probably only took a few seconds to know his whole story. And then I had to go back and, and write it down in a linear fashion to make it, to communicate it. You know. And this is very often uh, what takes place, especially when you go into much higher states of consciousness. Uh, you get, uh, you become aware of uh, mechanics which we, in, on this level, on this gross physical level, we just have no concept of, you know. Um, just to give you an example, there is the, um, uh, everything we see has got a sound component. You know, everything we, we smell has got a visual component. Every, all the senses have got additional components to it, you know. So you can, you can hear a color. You can hear a shape. You can see a, a sound. You know, there is a there is a much greater spectrum of perception than we have here, and it doesn't stop there. Attached to to this incredibly enhanced perception is also an incredibly uh, enhanced uh, greater awareness. You know, is is what is very often described as cosmic consciousness. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a much greater awareness which uh, you simply cannot translate into the linear workings of normal brain activity because we live in a, in a time zone, you know, where things progress to uh, one event after another in a sequence. This, this doesn't apply in those, on those states of consciousness. Everything is, is a, on a cosmic level. And it's quite, quite uh, pointless to actually try to describe it. If you if you consider, for example, um, try to is, describe to a blind person the color white, how, how where would you begin? You know, what words would you try to use? You know, to describe that. And it's a bit like that. So you you continuously thrown back to using metaphors and, and trying to bridge the gaps uh, between what our normal understanding, uh, you know, how it can relate to. But when you actually experience it, you would probably say, oh, well, that's what, you, what Jürgen said is a lot of nonsense. You know, that is on a totally different level what I experience it. And yet, I can't help I feel I need to somehow report these things because that is actually the greater potential of of human beings. You know, I feel that is the um, that is the next level of our evolution. You know, that is where we are aiming for as a species. You know, that we are progressing from these limitations we've set ourselves or our biological engines of determined. And I think we're just beginning uh, to to transcend the steps, and that's a, it's a totally new story. And I think that's actually happening right now. We are just beginning to to see, you know, that the world is, uh, you know, it's not limited uh, in terms of what the science is delivering almost on a day-to-day basis. It's just mind-boggling. You know, and the same um, when when people more and more people report sort of what is termed as an awakening experience, that may well be because people are better at communicating. They they are more um, we are we are social species. So if if one person uh, says something, then the other person, because we are akin, picks up on this vibrations, picks up on this energy, and they suddenly have a similar experience, you know. And because of the communications with the Internet, uh, we are much 
this has accelerated our our learning capacity and our uh, communication, and certainly people share uh, these transcendence into a higher states of consciousness, and more and more people become aware of it. And that's, I think, to me, this is just the beginning of a new cycle of our human evolution. You know, and, and that's what we very excited. Let's, I think that's where we move on for the final section. Really, we've got we've got about ten minutes left. Now, one of the things that you and I discussed when we met up, when we last met up in Brighton, it was a fascinating conversation. And some of the work you're now doing using virtual reality, things like the Oculus Plus, um, uh, Oculus Rift, various other things, plus your your personal talents as a as a as a digital artist, you're doing now some very very exciting things. And I wonder if you're willing to share with us for the last. 10 minutes or so, the kind of things that you're now taking forward, because I know personally I'm very excited about the things yeah. you're trying to do, and I'm sure the audience will be fascinated as well. Yes, that's right. I mean, I find it, I mean, I'm an illustrator and an artist, and I always found what's the best way to communicate what I've experienced? I thought the most easiest way or, or the most natural way was to do pictures, you know, and I happen to be, have, happen to have the tools which makes it much more easy these days to, to create representations of what I've experienced. So I, I started turning out some pictures, although they are not 100% literal, but they're sort of pointing in the right direction of what I've experienced. And I, and then lately, because of virtual reality, it's, all, it's the next step that's coming along. I thought, how can I give people the feeling of what it's like to go through a tunnel without staring at a flat two-dimensional screen? And, of course, virtual reality allows you to be immersed in it. So I, I created an app, which is called Celestial Song, um, where you put this headset on, and then people, you are in the space, which is not physical space, but which is a, is a very mental space. And you zoom through it, and, uh, and I use um, uh, the sounds of a composer friend of mine who based his music on ancient mantras, and it just draws you into this. And the idea is, or the, what I'm trying to achieve is to, to make a connection between what people see and, and some long-forgotten archetype which they may have experienced in the past but have no recollection of, you know. So I, I, thought, I was hoping, I'm hoping that suddenly the, the, the link becomes active and they say, oh, yes, I remember, I remember that. That is, uh, you know, happened to me. And I had good feedback from people um, who, who were very minded, uh, you know, of something that was very real, you know. And and so the next sta stage is, I mean, virtual reality in itself is going to be the biggest breakthrough in technology and will have the biggest impact, bigger than television, than the Internet, than the mobile phone. It will, it will be a huge, it will change consciousness on a global on a global level, you know. But I also want to use this technology uh, to, in a creative way. So instead of people uh, consuming content which designers and programmers provide them with, I would like to create content which triggers in people um, uh, an out-of-body experience, you know, by somehow um, giving... A, Clues or um, what's the word? Incubating uh, lucid dream content. You know, so when they when they uh, watch this virtual reality, when they enter this virtual reality, which is peppered with clues like "Are, are you dreaming?" Uh, you know, then they can uh, hopefully they start dreaming, and then they suddenly hear the voice in their dream, are you dreaming, which in lucid dreamers is very often a clue to become lucid in their dream. And, and these types of techniques, I'm still working on it, what is the best content to use in order to plant these, um, these words in the application so that people, when they actually experience it, uh, they will remember it and take it over to their dream. And I felt properly some emotional 
some some content that activates the emotion, you know, like, um, but I want it to be positive. I, you know, when you have, for example, watch a horror film late at night, you can't sleep or you have horrible dreams. I want uh, to create content which gives people positive good dreams and then implant these so they can instantly become aware of a, of a higher lucid level. And then the next stage is how to convert, once they're lucid, how to convert the lucidity into an out-of-body experience. And this is what this is very much what I'm working on at the moment and what, what I want to exploit, really. So, yeah. Well, well I, I, for one, am very, very keen to see more of this because um, a couple of days ago um, I bought a very cheap and cheerful um, virtual reality um, headset that can work with your, with your, with your uh, phone. Um, and I've downloaded two or three of the effects, and I found it quite stunning, absolutely quite stunning. It's quite disturbing because you really, it brings home to you just exactly how your senses process information. And if you, t I, I know that you'll know about this, Jürgen, but if you go onto the web and you look up um, on YouTube any of the videos on um, Oculus Prime, and the things that people, how people react as much as anything else to these states of consciousness, which effectively they are, you know, effectively this is how we perceive reality. People jump out of their skin, you know. Yes. And I think as a tool, that's going to be absolutely fantastic for you. Now, we're getting towards the end. One, one final question I'd like to ask you, which I think probably an awful lot of individuals want to ask. We've got about five minutes. If you could just very quickly just explain, what have you discovered so far? You've discussed about getting into your outer body, lucid dreaming, out of the body experiences, and different levels of reality. Um, mm -hmm. How far do you think you can go within these kind of nested realities? Uh, and where do they, will they ultimately lead? Yes, that's a good question. I think I always feel I've only scratched the surface, you know, uh, and I think it's literally an infinite. The, the higher or the more I I see or find, the, the, the more I realize how little I actually know and how much there is to it, you know. And, and it's a humbling experience when you get into these states. Um, you know so little, and there's so much more, and I feel I'm only just at the very beginning of it. It will take me more than a lifetime. You know, my, my dream is when I've sort of put this this physical body down eventually, you know, I, I think my work will really start then. You know, I want to become an explorer, you know, hopefully others will, will then join me, you know, and maybe we both can go on a trip together <laughs> and carry on our discussions, you know, while being in this uh, incredible virtual environment. Yeah, and, and explore. It's difficult when you have a physical body. And there's a reason why we have these bodies. There are certain types of information which we have to assimilate, you know, and, and we have to work with. But, but what we experience is only the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more, you know. And when people are getting prepared and they had a glimpse in it, I think the great, the positive thing of it is that when you actually die, you know, you won't experience a death, you will just experience a, a, a new level of consciousness, you know. And, and that's the greatest thing, because when I, um, since I had this experience, there's no fear of death. In fact, when I, uh, quite a few years ago, this is a long time ago now, I, I was diagnosed with cancer, you know, and um, there was no fear. You know, I had no fear. I, I wasn't afraid of what I may go through of impending death. And in that year, two of my friends died of the same cancer I was diagnosed with. Fortunately, with me, it, it was uh, the early stages, and I, I, I totally rid my body of it. But uh, that was a very important experience for me because it also not only did it give me the, the confirmation that there is no death and there is no fear because there is no outside world. You know, everything is consciousness.
You know, there's nowhere you can get lost in, or you, there's nothing you can lose. You know, not even your life, because consciousness is an infinite continuum. You know, and whether your your attention is focused on this physical shape is neither here nor there. Consciousness can focus anywhere. You know, where you place your attention. So the idea of a physical death totally loses its significance. You know, and uh, and that's why uh, I think okay. I mean, every day we wake up, we are just at the beginning of an infinite future. Infinite future. No matter how old you are. You know, you're only just at the beginning, okay? And and whatever it is, your reality is going to open up infinitely, you know? And there's always infinite joy to be had, an infinite adventure is just waiting in the wings. And, and th- this sort of awareness makes everything you experience here on this level infinitely meaningful. And, and gives significance to it and, and releases uh, your creativity. You know, that's how, how I look at it. What, what, what a final way to sort of finish an interview with that incredible speech of optimism. I mean, that was absolutely amazing, Jürgen. That was absolutely fantastic. Right, very, very quickly, we're into our last minute now. So if you can very quickly let everybody know where they can get in contact with you, what your books, your website and everything else, because your website is fantastic. It's, a, it's, a, mm-hmm. my, it's, it's just wonderful in terms of, of information there. So if you can give them those details, that would be really great. Yes, I think the easiest way is just to Google my name because there are only very few Zebras. There's just my brothers and me. And, and you will find there's, uh, there are links to my website, which is uh, lightandmagic.co.uk, which is my virtual reality website. And then there is uh, Multidimensional Man, which uh, deals with the levels of consciousness, which deals mainly with my book, and where I describe uh, everything which I've written in my book. And um, I I have neglected it a little bit because of my other work. But um, whenever I publish a book, and I have uh, Vistas of Infinity is the latest one, um, so... Yeah, people can also contact me on Facebook, you know, um, by befriending me. Uh, or, uh, I, unfortunately, I'm very, I get quite a few emails and I try to answer them. Uh, and I, sometimes I get whole catalogs of questions and it takes just so much time. So I've got a backlog at the moment going back to January of, of emails, which I, I'm trying to to answer, but uh, I always like to to read about people, what they are up to. Uh, you know, I've also created a soundtrack, which is a meditation soundtrack, um, which I brought back or was inspired by that, an out of body experience, which is based on the own. And this soundtrack has now been downloaded over well over two million times, and I get a lot of positive feed, feedback. Again, the people can just download it, it's free. And the application, uh, Celestial Song, is also free. People can go to my website. Then they have got an Oculus Rift. They can simply download it and, um, and can, uh, can experience it. I'm trying to make these things as accessible as possible. You know, so uh, I, don't, I don't, it's not a business. Uh, you know, I don't believe in this sort of turning into some sort of commercial thing. It's just there, and I think it's it's got to be shared. People need to be aware and, and have access to these experiences. So, so I'm hoping I can carry on doing this sort of thing and be a facilitator in some way. It's all, you know. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Jürgen. That was fascinating. Again, we must have you back for the show because, again, I know from reading your books that we have just scratched the surface in the terms that uh, of, of what you've experienced. We haven't really touched life after death and a lot of the other areas and the NDA and the other issues that you discuss as well. So we will have you back as a future guest. Right, everybody, thanks again for listening in. Um, next month, my guest is going to be a lady called Susan Leyburn. And Susan is a fascinating lady in the sense that she is an incredibly talented medium. Um, now, my, my opinion about mediumship is a little bit up and down in terms of this, but Susan 
is somebody who is really doing the, doing the business and everything else, and she's doing it from a scientific point of view as well. She's recently embarked upon a PhD program. Um, she's going to be a superb guest as well, as, there, as everybody else is. As always, my thanks to my guest, Jürgen Ziva, today. Also, as always, thanks to Radia Nunes over there in Denver for facilitating this show, because without Radia this, and Dia, this could not work. Okay, thanks, everybody, and we'll be in contact, and we'll, I look forward to seeing you in a few uh, in a period of time. Um, this will be up probably in a week or ten days' time um, and be able to be downloaded. But then again, you will have already downloaded it in the first place. Okay, thank you very much. And anybody, again, if they want to contact Jürgen on Facebook as well, Jürgen is a Facebook friend of mine as well. So we're all actually working together to change the paradigm. Okay, thank you very much, and I'll speak to you all again in a month's time. Thank you. Thanks, Jürgen. Yeah, thank you, Jürgen.